Welcome to the Get Good at Presenting podcast with Lee Jackson. Welcome to Get Good at Presenting the podcast. This week, I've got a good friend of mine, Pam Burrows. Hello, Pam. Hello, Lee. Oh, you're so bright and cheerful. What's your corporate kind of nickname? I like it. What's it? What is it, Pam? People booster. Right. <laughs> So if you, if you sounded really miserable, I guess you wouldn't be doing your job particularly well, would you? Yeah, I have to hide if I'm having a bad day because people are like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it well, uh, very often. well, I'll ask you about your job in just a moment. Uh, let me tell you a story about Pam. I have many stories. We did have a little, we sort of went to the pub together via video, didn't we, on Saturday night? It was nice. We did. It was very nice. Some very posh drinks were had. Very posh, very nice. So we, uh, yeah, I first met Pam. Pam is, is a speaker and trainer and a consultant, and she'll explain what she does in a moment. But let me tell you how I met her and how I think that she's brilliant and how she can help you today on this podcast. When I was president of the PSA, I was, I think I was president of the year before being president. I can't remember. But basically, I've been busy all weekend at a convention. I've been working really hard. And I just found a sofa, a leather sofa in the corner of the convention. And I just slumped on the sofa next to Pam. And then we got chatting. And I think we stayed there for well over an hour. And we just, <laughs> I just remember that was probably the first time I'd properly spoken to you. And I just, I just thought, Pam's great. This is great. So do you remember that moment? Do you remember? I do. I do. It always, whenever you talk about how long we've known each other, I picture that sofa. So yes, it, it stuck in my mind too. It was delightful because we, like you say, we hadn't really chatted. And I think we were both a bit tired and a bit overawed by the whole experience of conference. I think you were national president at the time. And I was a bit like, oh my God, the national president's talking to me. And, and then you were just dead real and really supportive of the things I talked about. And yeah, I just really felt like we connected. It was delightful. Oh, thank you. I don't know what to say. The president, I'm just, a, I'm just Lee. It was just a bit weird. But I think I was looking for somewhere to hide. And I saw you'd, you'd found the best sofa in the conference. And I thought, yeah, I'm just going to sit there. And, and, and when you do connect with somebody, you just think, yeah, you know what? We're just going to get on. And yeah. we hope to work together more in the future. You've stayed at my house and all that kind of stuff. And that all came from a random, sort of just a, a random sat down on a sofa. It's weird. <laughs> Life's weird, isn't it? Like that. It is, it is, because sometimes you might go out of your way to get to know somebody for whatever reason, and then the things that need to happen just happen. Synchronicity, I was going to say by accident, but I'm going to call it synchronicity. Oh, that's a posh word, that. I think there's a band in the 80s called Synchronicity, if I remember rightly. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, so, okay, that's enough about us. This podcast isn't about me and Pam, and I think she's brilliant. Pam, tell us exactly what you do. What do you do for a living? You know, how do you help people and businesses? So I go into organisations and I help them to have a proper, robust and end-to-end stress management strategy. So that starts with what are their policies, procedures and ways of assessing and dealing with stress and then how do they reduce it. So I, then I go into doing workshops for managers to support their staff around stress and how to reduce it and then workshops for everybody on personal techniques to deal with stress and how not to burn out so that's basically what i do sounds great fantastic so what we'll do is we'll do this podcast in two little halves it won't be super long but we're in two halves really where we can chat basically about some of the presentation skill stuff that you've learned so when you're working with people whether it's online or offline i'd just be interested to know a few of the tips you've learned and then after that i thought you know during this time of of lockdown and uh, people getting stressed out i thought why not why not while you're here, Pam? Maybe you can give us a few tips on staying a bit less stressed. Would you be able to help us with that? Sure. Happy. Great. So in all the years that you've been training, speaking, consulting, what's maybe three or four of the tips that you've learned, Pam, about engaging audiences? Because your subject is not known in the industry as being the most exciting one. It tends to be quite procedural, doesn't it? Well, it's funny, actually, because I've, I've actually been... a professional speaker in one way or another for about 30 years I know I don't sound old enough of course. And in, in the early days a lot of the training that I did was in social services so I'd be training on things like safeguarding and when you're talking about child protection you think well neither is that exciting and fun to do neither should it be but actually if you want people to learn and this is fundamental to everybody really who's a speaker is if you want people to really 
take in what you're saying, to engage with it and to take away the things you want them to learn, then they need to be fully alert. And the best way to do that is to be enjoying yourself. So whatever the subject, you know, you could throw me any subject and I will find a way to really engage people in that. And I think that's the, the first thing I'd say is that that's through stories and if they're personal and if they're funny, maybe a little bit self-deprecating, then it really grabs people's attention. That's that's one of the key things for me. I see. Yeah, I mean, I, I have alluded a couple of times on the podcast about speaking at funerals and I've done sort of two or three funerals. And even then it seemed inappropriate, but I did actually get a laugh at a funeral. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't wrong. It wasn't inappropriate, but there is humor even in some of the tougher situations. And I guess, yeah, well, child protection, I, I've done a bit of that training back in the days when I, in my youth work days, but yeah, to, to keep people engaged with something which is quite grim takes something special. And have you seen it done really badly? Oh, God, yeah. Well, we used to get trained by the local, the council's solicitor on the legal aspects of things that, you know, whenever the law changed, like when the very first Children Act came in, and he would have OHPs, you know, in the days when it was still a (laughs) plastic film, and he would have tons of them with loads of text on, and he would just talk and basically read through the slides. And honestly, people literally did fall asleep and have to be nudged from snoring. It was just dreadful. And then basically what we would do as trainers in the training team is we'd take that and then kind of make this beautiful alchemy between what people really needed to know and finding a way to put it across that they actually heard it because they were awake. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's funny, isn't it? It, uh, We've talked about it a lot, I guess, you know, in in presentation skills. This idea that people still have in their head that just because I'm talking means that people are receiving the information is the yeah. strangest thing in the world, isn't it? It is, it is. I mean, even if somebody's interested in what you're saying, if you say something really interesting, that'll send them off into a different train of thought. And they think, oh, how would I apply that? You know, even if they love what you're doing, they're going to be off with the fairies every now and again. So, you know, when I'm, most of what I do is running workshops, which will be a half day or preferably full day workshops I like the best. And, and in those situations, I will often do that old adage of tell them what you're going to tell them tell it to them, then tell them what you told them. But I do it in different ways with different stories, different words, in the hope that they'll get it at some point and giving them activities to do that, that brings it home. You know, it shouldn't always be chalk and talk. You've got to get them doing stuff, mm. thinking and working with each other. Yeah, so people always come back with that adage to me, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them again what you told them, all that kind of stuff. They all come with various versions of what you just said. But when people say that, what they usually mean is, I'm going to tell them with a PowerPoint slide or a flip chart, then I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end, I'm just going to do exactly the same thing again. Uh, so, so how do you mix it up? So say you're talking about stress busting or something, you know, how do you mix it up? So you're telling them the, the same thing three times, but in which context would you use? You know, how would you mix that up? So let's say, for instance, I'm talking about getting too busy and getting too close to burnout and cramming your diary. So the first thing I might do is get them to get their diaries out and actually have a look at how crammed their diaries are. So we're making the point about not cramming your diary. Then I might talk about a story where I've crammed my diary. For instance, I often tell the story about a past partner of mine said, uh, I was going to book as a surprise holiday in those four days that are a gap in your diary, but I decided I would tell you about it. And I said, well, I'm bloody glad because although it's not written in my diary, I know in my head, I'm really busy those four days with things I need to do. And so telling stories that bring it to life. And then the the thing they might do at the end is to summarize the key points about that and what they might do with it. So it's about illustrating it, demonstrating it, explaining it. And then what do we do that can be different? Sometimes we get, especially with stress and things like that, you get stuck in, this is how we do it wrong rather than, and this is what you can do about it. So it's ensuring that they're finding different ways in, you know, if they're, if it's making them connect to a similar story that they've experienced or they're able to picture in their head what happened to you or it's made them laugh. So there's different ways of saying the same thing. That's, that's key really. In your stuff. So say if you're with a group of managers, say you're with a group of, I don't know, public sector managers, they're all busy, they're all stressed out. 
they all get 300 emails a day, which they weirdly feel that they have to reply to because we've all been in those situations. <laughs> Actually, when you talk about stress, does it not kind of stress them out that you're talking about stress? I don't think so, because what happens mostly is we're basically taking the lid off or the cling film, if you like, off uh-huh. something that was already there. We're just having a look at it. So there is a point on some of my workshops where I will get them to talk about the things that stress them. But immediately we've done that, I'll say, how do you feel now compared to before you started talking about it? And they will say, oh, I got to feel so much more stress now. Now I'm kind of remembering it and describing it and whatever. Yeah. And so it's perfect for me because when I have the most powerful impact on people is when they're experiencing it in the moment. And obviously I'm not there with them on the shop floor when disaster strikes. So I get them talking about it, thinking about it, and then they're, they're feeling more stressed than they were. And then immediately show them a technique to use and then bring their heart rate down, get them feeling much brighter and clearer. So in that moment, straight away, they can see how it works and then they're more likely to use those techniques afterwards. So yes, they get more stressed, but only when I make that happen because I want it to (laughs) immediately unstress them. Yeah, because I mean, I can imagine sort of busy leaders and stuff going, you know, I'm too stressed out to uh, go on a stress management half day. You know, you can imagine that kind of discussion, you know, or they're, I haven't got time to go on a productivity course today. Oh, I tell you, I've had the most people turn up late or not turn up at all when I do anything that's got time management to do with it. And it just makes me smile every time because the people who need it most are the people who say you can't possibly get there. But I also think that what's really important as a presentation skill, especially when doing workshops, is that you acknowledge early on what people are experiencing. So I'll often start with a bit of a joke, like, I know that you've been counting the days down, you've been crossing it off on your calendar to to get to today because you really want to be away from all of those other things that you should be doing. And and you're really looking forward to everything just hanging in the air until you get back to it because you've got so much time on your hands to spend here today. And just make a joke about pretending that they really have got nothing else better to do. Sometimes I will do a little warm up game where I say, what would you rather be doing right now? And some people will say, I'd rather be ticking off my to-do list than be here. There's just something about acknowledging an emotion that takes all the power out of it. So for Mm. instance, if you're really, really angry, if you're really seething at something to actually say, I'm really angry about this will very much change the heat of it. You know, it's, it's when we're kind of holding it in and feeling cross about it and nobody understands me, that's when yeah. it seems to kind of balloon up. So yeah, just acknowledging the fact that they have right. got better things to do, but hopefully there was something useful in the session. So your job as a presenter really in those contexts is to take the cling film up, you know, open a lid of something and mm-hmm. actually allow that, which must take a lot of, there's a lot of gray areas in that. There's a lot of, things that could go wrong you know how do you prevent when you're in a workshop how do you how do you keep track of what's happening in the room because when i'm if i do small group stuff presentation skills and other things that i do in a small group i often feel exhausted at the end of the day and i realize it's because i've been managing everybody's emotions i've been keeping them on track i've been trying to you know how do you manage a say group of 12 people where they're all different you know what, what, any tips around that I try and connect with them straight away. So I welcome them. I get to know their names. I write them down. People think I remember them, but I I write them down where they're sitting. If they change seats, then blown. (laughs) But I also make them responsible too. I think over the years, I used to very much be about, let me give you as much as I can. Let me be there for everybody. And actually, it needs to be a circle. It needs to be, you give them something, they give you something. They take responsibility for how they're doing, what they're learning, keeping tabs on things. For instance, something as simple as getting them to summarize what we learned so far in the last hour or two hours. Because A, then you don't have to do it. B, it really boosts their learning when they're having to go back over it and what you've done but also you then while they're doing that you get to see what they're picking up what they've missed 
you get to watch the room. You know, in years ago, we hardly ever used to do any training with one person because it was always about, hang on, we're dealing with very sensitive issues here. We're working with people. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. I used to be training health visitors, the police, social workers, NHS workers all in the same room who were all dealing with their own traumas and their clients' traumas. And and we would always have somebody else in the room to keep an eye. Is anybody crying? Is anybody walked out? Do we need to follow them? How are they? Does somebody need quiet time? So many emotional issues we were dealing with. And now mostly, you know, pretty much all the time I'm on my own. So I'm watching out for that. But I'm also saying to them, hey, this is big stuff. If you need to speak to me, you come speak to me. You know, if you need time at break time or afterwards, yeah. then let's chat. And, you know, there have been times where people have, have then talked to me about suicidal thoughts or major grief that they've experienced only the week before. And these are things that they, at that point, had not spoken to anybody else about in the organization. So this is why I don't just go in and do workshops anymore. I say to the organization, What else are you doing? Because I'm going to be taking the lid off. You need to be ready to help people and support them with what comes out of that. You know, you can't just give them a day with me and then think that's sorted everything. No, we're starting a process here. So it's about not taking it all on your shoulders. You know, what else is happening to support the process? Wow, that's fascinating. So yeah, so you don't kind of turn up and, and go for it. Cause I heard some horror stories of some people going into an organization and just, just opening up kind of wounds and opening up like trauma stuff. And then, you know, just, okay, bye. That's the end of the session. And they're walking out, you know? Yeah. So you, so your approach in your business is to, is to set up that stuff so you can actually back that up. The people have got, you know, counselors to go and speak to and all that kind of stuff. So that's fascinating way beyond just doing a talk or a session, isn't it? Because it's dangerous otherwise, you know, I mean, even if you're dealing with reasonably banal stuff, you know, say it's something Mm -hmm. that we're creating a new website or, you know, something that's very practical, there still might be somebody in the room who's got something going on, nothing to do with what you're talking about, but something going on. So I think as facilitators, we have a duty of care in that moment. I mean, I've got a social work background and prior to that, a childcare background. So it's, you know, I've got that knowledge. I have worked as a counsellor. I do work as a coach. So I've got, I've got those skills and I can pull them out. But I just worry that people will go in because they know the subject, but they don't really know how to deal with people and people's reactions to it. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's good to have that level of care. I think it's, it's really important, you know, and sometimes Mm. it it can be life-saving. Wow. Fascinating stuff. So I know that you speak as well. So I guess a bit like me, you know, you speak at conferences on a main stage sometimes and you do the smaller room stuff, you know, the leadership stuff and that kind of thing. Maybe speak now. We've been talking a lot about groups. What's the main difference for you when you get out of a training room and you end up being a platform speaker? What do you do differently in those, in those situations, Pam? What changes in your head, I guess? Well, to start with, not a lot. So when I first started doing the bigger stuff, I behaved like I was a trainer still. And I realized actually some of that stuff doesn't compute. And especially if you're getting people to think deeply about things and then you've got a room full of, I don't know, 250 people. Mm. You can't can't then take care of everybody, you know, and say, come talk to me at lunchtime because you're just inundated. So the thing that changes for me is that it needs to be encapsulated. It needs to be a body of of learning that that can stand alone you know without me having the rest of the day to speak to people and I need to and I think this is even after all these years this is something that I'm only really getting my head around now I have to behave as if I do already know them and we have already built rapport and and we have a connection And I don't mean that in an arrogant, complacent way. I mean that I call it the Terry Wogan effect. So people (laughs) used to say about Terry Wogan, the radio presenter, on mostly on Radio 2, that if you were listening to him in your kitchen in, I don't know, Bolsover, wherever you were, it would feel like Terry was just speaking to you and there was nobody else there. Yeah. 
And so I try and do that no matter how many people in the audience, instead of in a workshop, I would be literally speaking to people individually. In a big conference, I will say, for instance, I'll say you rather than you all or is anybody here experienced I would say have you experienced and I would speak as if I'm only speaking to one person and as if I I understand something fundamental about their humanity I find that helps more than anything really because I think to start with I was a bit I was like a kid on a stage you know with like (laughs) I'm just kind of performing whereas I try and bridge the gap really between the just talking to one person and talking to mm. a whole yeah that, that's really nice so you so there might be 250 people in the room you know and like me you you're often you know you're one of six people that day or something and one of those is the finance report and one of those is the profit report or the the latest government legislation and they right and now our guest speaker <laughs> and for you to engage in people in an individual level I, I like i really like that approach that you're able to do that um, it's so funny, actually, because they'll often say, well, we're going to put you on after the finance to the reports because we need you to cheer them up again. Or we're going to put you on at the end because they're going to need a real lift after they've had all this bad news we're giving them. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, my, my favourite my favorite organisations are when they'll say, right, they bring me in early enough for, for me to say, right, what's the rest of the thing that's happening? Let me work with the finance director so that what they're presenting is done in a way which is interesting and a bit fun and useful let me talk to the hr director who's really nervous about their speech and let's do some confidence tricks and and actually you know just help the whole thing to be a better Mm. experience rather than you know this is all a bit either boring or awful and then we'll bring the clown in at the end you know (laughs) so (laughs) let's make it all let's all make it a better experience for everybody yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's great. I love it when I work with clients and the, you know, when I say to them, I can help you a little bit more, you know, I don't have to just do the talk. I can help you to develop things in certain ways. I can coach people a little bit. I can help you. Eat. I can even look at your slides beforehand and everything. Oh, really? You can do that? So, yeah, yeah. Because because part of that is selfish in a way, because yeah. I think if I make the rest of the day go well, yeah. then my talk's going to go better, isn't it? You know? Yeah. I'm so with you on that. I'm so with you. I just can't stand it when you're, you know, just, it just feels like there's a professional pride in, you know, being able to say I'm part of this conference, which is being done well compared to you, you're standing at the back of the room, you're going to be on in a half an hour or whatever. And then somebody puts up this slide that I, I was at one conference actually, and they actually put up a photocopy of a whole A4 page of writing (laughs) that was probably, you know, an 11 point font on the page. And then they put it up as a slide. I'm just like, God, I'd struggle reading that if I got the piece of paper in front of me, Never mind. And then they read through it. I was like, oh my God. But there are situations like that. And that was one of them where you could offer to say, let me help you to do this better and they won't see the problem they don't they think no everybody needs yeah. this information this is what we need to do today and so mm-hmm. yeah you can't you can't force a horse to drink as it were yeah i was at a conference recently well i say recently obviously not in the last three weeks but <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yes i've been uh, well here uh, for the last month but i was <laughs> i was at a conference and they made it really formal and i don't think they understood why because There was people stood on the stage. There was a kind of a, you know, a top table, if you like, a posh panel that was permanently there. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And it was like, oh, man. And I was trying to chat to them about it. And and I think it it made the whole conference feel a lot more formal than it needed to be. Because it was like the head teacher was always watching, you know what I mean? Yeah. And And those people on that top table probably felt really uncomfortable as well. You know, they can't kind of cough or pick their nose or, or whatever they needed to do. <laughs> Which is definitely what we're, what we're noticing on Zoom because we're all doing hundreds of Zoom calls like we are at the moment. We're, we're noticing that on a Zoom call, you can't disappear like you do in a room, you know, and yeah. I can, you know, you can check your emails, you can, yeah, pick your nose, uh, comb your hair, you know, and you can't, you can't do that on a Zoom call. So. <laughs> I think that's why people are so stressed out about online presenting and stuff because there's nowhere to hide unless you switch the camera off. 
Yeah, and, and you're this- full on. You're full on, aren't you? Yeah. I've done one piece of work, didn't disappear when the crisis hit. A university that I was due to do a talk for said, we'll take it online. And so I had 60 engineers on Zoom. Mm. And that was one of those situations where I really had to behave as if they were in the room. We'd already got to know each other. They were loving it because you haven't got that feedback. So you've got to kind of imagine it, you know, and bring the energy to uh, the situation and and did something that I know you do, Lee, which was I stood up and I had a flip chart and I kind of felt like I would if I was in a real room. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide. And another little tip. I know that a lot of people will be getting the hang of this using the breakout rooms in Zoom because then for a few moments I could just breathe, gather myself in the way that I would (laughs) if I sent them off to do an activity in the room, you know, because otherwise, God, you're just full on all the time, you know, and uh, bringing the energy. Yeah, absolutely. I found an app on the App Store. I was thinking while we're on Zoom and everything, it's like it's a soundboard, basically. We'd like to get feedback off people. We like to see the eyes, don't we? We like to... Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, so I found the one, so I've got, it's, it's an app. So here it is. I'll put it next to the microphone. So you can get cheering. <laughs> you can have laughter. So, which is quite nice. So there's all sorts of things and you can get. <laughs> I love it. You can have all these different things, which I thought, I thought that'd be, that'd be really nice. You can even have. Oh my God, I have to have one of those. You have oh, to send me the link. I have to have one. Great, that's a great little app. Just, I think it's just called Studio or Studio Audience. I think it might even be free. Oh, it's an app, not a piece of kit. Right, yeah. No, it's an app. You know, it's an app, yeah, just on the App Store on the, on the phone. So I just thought, yeah, that'd be great. I can use it for a bit of comedy effect. But, you know, if something's not going so well, at least I can give myself a round of applause. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, okay, so what I'm interested in, because I've just tidied up my office and I've put a lot of my stuff away. Sadly, I've put stuff away thinking I'm not going to need that for a few weeks or even months. Stuff Because I have a box that I take with me. And I have done a podcast about my box with Roger Harrop, as you, you know, Roger. Yes. And he has a famous box. So my kind of box of stuff that I take out with me, is it's just kind of sat there now. So when you go out and those days, remember when we used to go out, those heady <laughs> days, when... <laughs> When you go out and do training, what do you take with you? What's in your box of tricks? Well, anything that people might not realize they need, but uh, what do you take with you? Um, I'm very fussy about my flip chart pens. I always have my own flip chart pens. Particular um, brand? Yes. Well, actually, we're struggling to replenish at the moment. I think they've stopped doing them, which is just terrible, which oh. is barrel wedge tipped. Oh, no. Because I don't like the ones that have an aroma, you know, the kind of alcohol smell. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. There are not many wedge tipped that aren't smelly. So those are my flip chart pens. I take a little oh. tiny digital clock so I know where we're at timing wise. Okay, um, great. And I take an inflatable hammer and a large <laughs> sponge thumbs up. Uh, inflatable hammer why, why not take an inflatable hammer that's what i say you never know when you're going to need one right i think I, you can you can explain in a few minutes what that is i think i might know what that might be <laughs> so you know your flip chart marker with a chisel tip is that what you're looking for yeah yeah they I've used just, to do them I've in just check they're on amazon 15 pounds 10 oh is that a box of eight i think it is yes a box of eight yeah it's go. annoying because they used to do boxes of four but now you can only get them in eights and you get an orange and a yellow one, which aren't very useful very often. No, who wants a yellow pen? Indeed. Uh, yeah, that's difficult, isn't it? But uh, your pens, it's quite funny. People get quite, trainers and speakers love a pen. You know, they love a yeah. certain pen and I have mine, pens and stuff like that. That's good. So pens, your inflatable stuff. Any yeah. other things, any technical stuff that you would take with you? Or? A spare extension plug in case we haven't got everything we need. I take yep. my own clicker. I take... Cool all the cables for charging my phone and all of that. Oh, I take a speaker with me. I always have music wherever I am. So I take an iPod that isn't my phone for the music, so it's not, it's not reliant on my phone. And I have a Jambox. They've stopped making them. Jambox Bluetooth speaker. I have a variety of music. So I do stuff for coming into the room, stuff for energizing people after lunch, stuff for playing in the background while people are doing activities and that kind of thing. Oh, that's good. That's what I worked with one client and I suggested them using music at the beginning of a session. 
just to help people to relax a little bit, give them a talking point, you know, just break the silence. Yeah. Honestly, they thought I'd like brought like wisdom from the gods to them, you know, <laughs> they were like, really? Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, why wouldn't you play music? Because I've been a DJ most of my life. Music's been part of my life, you know? So yeah. I'm like, why wouldn't you use that? We never yeah. thought about that before, Lee. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I often do that. If I'm speaking at a conference where they, they haven't thought about it, I'll say, look, I've got my kit. Do you want me to put it on? They go, oh my God, yeah, that's, yeah. oh, it really feels nice now. People coming into the room and feeling, and it's about setting the tone, isn't it? Making sure that people know that this is going to be an enjoyable experience. Yeah, when I was running the PSA convention as, as president, one of the first things I did was not book the speakers as I made a playlist of the music. Because <laughs> in previous years, they'd put on like, you know, that kind of royalty-free, cheesy music that doesn't go anywhere, which yeah. is fine. But, the, the, you know, the, it was legal because the, the venue has a license and everything. So I just made a playlist of my favorite songs and I made a playlist of chilled out music and a playlist of upbeat music. And yeah. I just said to the guys, use the ones that's appropriate. So I took, you know, 200 songs with me and it made a difference i think they're probably still on the they're probably still being used to be honest but <laughs> music's important that's great okay so thanks so much that's really helpful stuff around small room stuff workshop stuff there's some gold in there for anyone listening who does workshops but let's switch and actually ask you some advice so we are in a time now which is unprecedented we have never seen this we've never been on lockdown like this and I know the first few days certainly stressed me out because everything was being changed. You know, my business, my work, family life, everything. There's a family wedding in August. We're thinking about all this kind of stuff. So could you just give us maybe two of your three favorite tips for just surviving in a crisis, really, and, and, and being a bit less stressed, Pam? How can you help us? Okay, so one of the things that I became very aware of is that almost overnight, my social media that I might just scroll through for entertainment, there was nothing that wasn't about the virus. And that's still pretty much the same. There's very few posts, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, there's very few things that aren't related to the virus. And so we need to have other things going on. And one of the things that I think a lot of people are struggling with as well is that it's affecting their sleep because we're feeling this low level of stress. So there's adrenaline and cortisol, the stress hormones are happening in our bodies. And we've got this kind of low level of being on, on alert, as it were. And so one of the key things that I think we can all benefit from at the moment is finding time where we just decompress. You just do something else entirely, something daft, something pleasurable, something where there's a single point of focus. So SPF, but not sun cream, your your single point of focus on something that just clears the mind and then have a mantra, something that you repeat to yourself, like I am safe and I am well or I'm safe and I'm loved, or I'm just focusing on now, or Mm. this is where I am. You just keep repeating to yourself that you're just staying in the moment. It's so easy to catastrophize about what else is going on in the world or what's happening in the future or all of these things. And of course, we do need to plan and we need to have our eyes wide open. But catastrophizing is a whole other thing. So it's about making sure that what's going on in your head isn't as crazy as what's going on on the media and all of those things. That single point of focus was the, I think it was last weekend or the weekend before, I spent nearly a whole day like hosing my patio down. (laughs) (laughs) Trust me, I hate the garden. Claire's my wife, she's the gardener. I don't know anything like that. But honestly, I spent ages cleaning the patio with one of those power hose things. Yeah. And and I was thinking, what am I? And I thought, you know what? It's that's what I was doing, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Spending four hours just focusing on a pavement. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's really important to allow yourself to do things that seem less meaningful or even pointless. Because as kids we do that, you know, we sit playing with pebbles in the garden, lining them up and then sucking them up and then lining them up and counting them and no purpose at all other than being lost in the moment. And we really, really <laughs> seriously need that right now. Yeah, that's a really good tip. So single point of focus, SPF, I like that. I'll notice that when I look at my uh, suntan lotion, which we hopefully will use in the next few weeks. So it, <laughs> that's good. Explain about the hammer. You take an inflatable hammer with you. So what's the hammer thing then? I talk quite a lot about self-talk. So how are you speaking to yourself in your own mind? And a lot of us 
we don't even notice how often we beat ourselves up. So I use the hammer to demonstrate how we beat ourselves up through the day, various things, you know, you've dropped something or you've done something wrong or you've forgotten something or whatever it might be, or you said the wrong thing to somebody and you beat yourself up. So I, I demonstrate with this inflatable hammer, which on a longer workshop gets a bit deflated by the end of the day. And that's, <laughs> that's basically what I'm trying to help people to do to deflate that hammer start speaking kindly to yourself because that's when you can really change the stress hormones you speak kindly to yourself and say yeah I did just forget that or drop that or break that or do that wrong but that's because of what's going on because I'm tired because I need a break that's okay what am I going to do to fix it and you speak more kindly to yourself and that can reduce the stress hormones and help you to focus on solutions rather than problems Mm, that's a really good tip yeah self-talk i do stuff around that obviously because you know a motivational speaker and stuff you got to do self-talk i love the idea of the hammer so it's a great little presentation tip you can imagine now pam banging herself on the head with a inflatable hammer not a real hammer i do hasten to add but it's just a, that's just perfect i always think a prop is a slide replacement right yes a plop a prop gets you a plop. A prop. <laughs> a prop gets. <laughs> that's not the kind of prop you want. <laughs> no, that's not. That's a different thing altogether. I think I'll leave that bit in as well. But yeah, so a prop it just replaces you reading from a slide, replaces you just reading from a handout, and people will remember. Do people mention to you later on, or oh, remember the hammer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they remember the hammer. I could make a business on selling them. People go, oh, we want one of those. We want one of those for our team. Usually it's because they actually want to hit somebody with it rather than <laughs> remember the principle. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, well, that's it. It gets you memorable. It helps them to make a point. And you, yeah. you, you mentioned towards the, the beginning, you know, you tell them, you tell them again, and you tell them what you just told them. You're doing that with an inflatable hammer, which I think is fantastic. That's great. So have you got maybe one last tip for us to help us be a bit less stressed out in this COVID season? I think one of the things that we've seen a lot across the internet is, you know, you should learn something new and you should come out stronger and blah, blah, blah. Actually, sometimes you've just got to feel the feeling. So whatever's happening for you on that day, rather than just trying to push on ahead, is just to feel the feeling, acknowledge that it feels a bit wonky, acknowledge that you feel a bit fearful or whatever. Don't get stuck in it. So as Paul, Mr. Sumo would say, Paul, Paul McGee, McGee. Yeah. Sumo would say, you know, shut up, move on. Acknowledge the feeling and then figure out a way to move forward. So I have lots of techniques on YouTube that you can use to acknowledge the feeling, but then work out how you're going to lift your spirits a little and find a way to move on. That's great. Yeah. And acknowledge the feeling. I was just, I was just reflecting the other day. I've done in the past lots of work on men, trying to understand men. I like a challenge, Pam, you know, <laughs> so, cause you know, like someone like yourself, you're so open and what you see is what you get with Pam really. I, I get you, you know, if I meet you and I see you and I give you a hug, I can immediately tell, you know, where you're at. Do you know what I mean? Cause yeah. you're, you're a very open person and I love that. But reflecting a lot of men, men, they talk about the man cave or the man shed. And I was just reflecting on this the other day that a lot of blokes do ignore their feelings and they hide from it. And sometimes they hide literally in the shed. Sometimes it's, it's in music or in football or in talking about cars. And I was yeah. thinking in this lockdown, particularly with no sport around, which is just, you know, a hobby, but sometimes I think blokes and women too, I guess, can hide in these things. And this is a time when you can't hide as much as you used to. So you're going to have to, we're going to have to tackle our feelings really, aren't we, in this lockdown? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And finding a safe way to do that, I think is really important and to know that it's, it's okay to not feel strong or to feel angry about the situation. It's finding, and unfortunately, we're, we're seeing a huge increase in domestic violence and murders of partners at the moment as a result of people just, you know, not having that escape. I don't think it's the lack of football, obviously, in that situation. But yeah, it's knowing yourself and there's an opportunity here. And I think that's the big thing. There's an opportunity for each of us to mm. learn a bit more about ourselves and to find new ways of doing things that we haven't needed to do in the past. Because you can, 
there's a survey going around by the University College London, which I recommend everybody has a go at because it's it's basically a survey of what's going on for you. Because I think a little snippet of what's going on for the country right now, I think we will definitely see people drinking more alcohol, eating more junk food and sugar. You know, we're all self-medicating. And at some point, we need to come up for air and go, is there a different way of doing this? Could I meditate? Could I have a conversation with somebody who's going to understand what I'm going through? Can I do some form of exercise that's going to release that tension? Can I find a new hobby that I can get lost in and feel calmed by? You know, we all need to find new ways to do that. Self, instead of self-medicating, but actually self-soothing, which is going to be better yeah. for us. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. So thank you, Pam. I feel we feel like we've got we've got training tips, presentation tips, and stress busting tips all in one thing, all in one episode. So thanks for being so open, Pam. Thanks for being so flexible. Tell everybody how they can find you on the web, as it were. On the interwebs. So you can find me at pamboros.com, B-U-R-R-O-W-S. And at the bottom of every page of my website, you can also sign up to a Monday motivator. So every Monday morning at 6 a.m. for quite a few years now, I send out a little short blog with some reminders of how to feel better. And I always include on there one of my YouTube videos. So you can find me on YouTube, Pam Burrows People Booster, where I've got lots of techniques for staying calm, for boosting confidence. And I'm also doing daily videos at the moment on LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'm putting those onto YouTube as well, little daily videos to hopefully help people feel better. So yeah, and I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And but yeah, just look for Pam Burrows People Booster on your favorite social media platform. Wow, fantastic. Thanks so much, Pam. Uh, hopefully we'll get to speak to you again sometime. Maybe we should do it when we're outside, like together. In a, oh, in a room, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Lovely. That would be delightful. I look forward to that day. <laughs> Thank you. So please go to pamburrows.com or just search for Pam Burrows People Booster and that'll be fantastic. And don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast as well and we'll keep these fairly regular and always have interesting guests in and around presenting online and offline. So please do subscribe and tell all your friends. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much for having me. You're such a pleasure to talk to, Lee. Oh, bless you. I paid her to say that. Thank you. All the best. (laughs) Bye. Thanks for listening to the Get Good at Presenting podcast with your host, Lee Jackson. If you'd like to know more about Lee's work as a motivational keynote speaker and presentation coach, visit his website at leejackson.biz. That's leejackson.biz.